Hello again. This is part two of the soft matter lecture. And in this lecture, I'm going to concentrate on the properties of soft matter. So um, let's start from the beginning. Soft matter is a subclass of condensed matter and its main characteristic is that it is soft. By soft, I mean it is easily deformed uh, with, by weak um, external fields. And there are many types of soft matter, and this is basically what this 15-minute uh, introduction is going to uh, concentrate on, is to tell you a little bit about the different types and to try and highlight what in these systems is makes them uh, unique and why uh, in some sense they have different but properties that can be classifiable under the soft matter heading and you know you, you can you can describe these as sensible or very sensitive to uh, fluctuations even thermal ones uh, or other forces and um, very slow responses. Okay, here you have different types, so we're going to go back to them a little bit later, so I don't want to waste too much time uh, in, 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 in describing them now. Okay, so why is soft matter physics, uh, or when the, did soft matter physics start? And this is debatable, but I could say, or for me, I think uh, the work of the gen on polymers and by some Edwards also on polymers, uh, where they applied field theoretic ideas, scaling like in the previous uh, part one uh, that I mentioned. I think those types of results for the structure and even for the dynamics of polymers have been extremely important, not only in describing and developing polymer physics, but in bringing to um, systems which were considered to be too complicated to be treated by physical theories, um, tools from theoretical physics that help to simplify the solutions and to be able to, with those tools, to um, get many different uh, behaviors that were considered to be out of reach from theoretical description. Okay, so Dujen actually got the Nobel Prize. Sam Edwards did not, but uh, that's life. So I'll start with the building blocks and just contrasting the building blocks in hard condensed matter and soft condensed matter. So hard condensed matter, I could say the blocks are either atoms or small molecules, while in uh, soft matter, they're much bigger um, blocks like macromolecules or colloids. And this has as a consequence that the interactions between the blocks are very different. Between atoms, we have interactions which are uh, among electrons. So uh, like in a hydrogen atom, we have a bonding uh, or covalent bond of uh, four electron volts, 4.5. In colloids, for example, of a micrometer size, the interaction energy, uh, it's an effective energy uh, and it's calculated using um, the free energy of the solution with the particles at diff different distances. And therefore, um, these interaction scales and therefore the force scales with Kt, where T is the room temperature. So at room temperature, this difference in energies is tremendous. It's between four electron volts and 140, one over 40 electron volts. So the energies are much different. Another thing I want to point out before I actually describe different systems where this actually happens is that uh, the blocks themselves that make uh, soft matter, they can be uh, flexible. They can change. They can change uh, by changing the temperature, for example, of the system or the concentration of small molecules. And I'll give you an example of that. So not only are these blocks large, 
their shapes are not always fixed. They can even respond to small changes in uh, temperature, for example, and therefore uh, the function of these um, systems, the assemblies of these blocks, they can be made very responsive to stimuli that you know will not kill um, if it is a living system will not kill the living system a very small change in temperature for example okay so but of course there is a challenge everything comes at a price so although here i have child's blocks and i can make them any which we whatever actually i make them of soft matter but it doesn't matter so in real life i have to make them up of atoms and so i start with a scale scale of which is between the atoms i have to make the blocks usually on this type of dimension micrometers and then i have to assemble the micrometer sized blocks to make the soft matter and so if you look here there is at least 10 orders of magnitude of difference in the extended structure and the atoms themselves because as i said colloids have to be synthesized and and often you have to do it starting with the material you have which is on earth is, is the atoms I'll give you some examples now. So as I said, the first class I want to mention uh, is polymers, not only because of the work of Sam Edwards and, and, and Dejean, but because polymers are everywhere. They're in your body as biopolymers. Uh, they're in nature for ages, like the jumper I'm wearing or the uh, pattern I used uh, in pink for a knitted uh, wool pattern. So that's also polymer. And of course, all these things are soft, you know, you can, you can understand these, these things are soft and therefore some are natural. And the revolution occurred in terms of applications when polymers were made in the lab and they could be made very cheaply in very large quantities. And uh, they, they have an impact in our everyday life, which we hardly um, notice, but it, 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 it's large impact. But a polymer is really just a repeat uh, of monomers. And this repeat uh, is usually organized in a linear chain, although the chain can be branched. The chain itself can contain thousands of monomers, up to millions or even, well, billion maybe it's a bit too much, but some, some, some polymers can be rather large uh, in terms of the number of molecules or small repeating units. So the molecule itself is uh, a many body system, but this is where the scaling ideas by Dejean helped so much because it can help, it helped a lot to sort of understand how they behave collectively because they, they, because they're big, they also, you know, they're complicated, but it's so big that they scale in some way like we've seen for the critical phenomena. So here are some pictures from Wikipedia of a real polymer on the left, which is about 600 monomers and a model of a DNA uh, bit of DNA uh, helix, helix. And um, these are from Wikipedia and I could, I could give you many more examples, but there's no time. Just to mention to Dejan and to his book and not only to his book and to the scaling ideas that he put forward, but also in his book, he makes it, the book is rather old now, he makes a big point of the experimental tools that became available and helped the theoretical developments, um, either to guide them or the other way around to prove them. So this was neutron um, neutron diffraction, deuterated neutron, and also other techniques. So this is this is theory and 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 experiment all often go uh, along and and without. The one without the other is very often very difficult to make any progress. I want to finish, however, with something which is very common. So even though these molecules are huge by nanometer uh, standards, uh, a material is not made by one molecule, but by an extended system of these molecules. They can be organized in different ways, and I'm not going to have time to, to, to say very much, but for example, they can often uh, occur in this semi-crystalline state, not fully crystalline, uh, they can also appear in, in a disordered glassy state. 
And this is this final structure that has an impact on the properties. But for this structure, it's the shape of the molecules themselves, the macromolecules that will then lead. So it's a hierarchical uh, structure that is, um, that's why it's so flexible to, to, to you, you get so many different behaviors. But on the other hand, um, uh, it, it's also sometimes uh, very complex. Okay, so, so polymers are everywhere. I'm not going to repeat what I wrote. You can read it, you can read it in the notes. Let me go to the next system. The next system is amphiphiles, and I could have used the word surfactants. I don't know which one is more uh, familiar to you, but these are crazy molecules a little bit because one, they're usually small, but one part likes water, the other part hates water. And so by themselves, they don't do very much. You put them in water and then they organize themselves to either avoid the water if they hate uh, or to, to expose the size that like water to water. So, and if you put them in, in, in the, the bits of the molecule that don't like water, they, they, they often like oil very much. So if you put them in, in oil, they also uh, form these, uh, these structures. And once they form these structures, uh, then the structures themselves, depending on the concentration, like the polymers, they can organize themselves in extended uh, systems with certain types of order. So these are not only important because soap is an amphiphile and we know how good soap is to, to clean and how important it was in, in, in development of many other things. And uh, many biological things inside you are also amphiphilic. And uh, there are many applications uh, that uh, I didn't actually put here, but for example, new drug delivering systems are made using these, these principles. So here is a cartoon of an amphiphile. This is the water loving in blue. This is the water hating uh, in red with the tail. Uh, the shape of the molecules very often is not exactly like these, but they usually uh, some resemblance, but this is a cartoon. And by themselves, they don't do very much, but if in water or at an interface, for example, if this is oil, this is water, they would organize like that. That's why they reduce the surface tension. In water, they would probably do a bilayer so that they would expose their heads to water, or they would round up as a micelle, depending on the shape, the concentration, and so on, the shape of the molecule themselves. So this is what they can do. And if you, if you now, uh, if this is in water now, if you do in oil, you can invert these kind of structures and you can get really um, crazy types of arrangements, some of which actually very simple. They sort of uh, crystalline. Unlike polymers, these things, they can, they can be uh, crystalline and they can, they can even make uh, liquid crystals. So this is a, a type of diagram where you have concentration of water, pure water, pure oil. And then as you go up, this is the concentration of the amphiphile. And depending on these ratios, you can get all sorts of microstructure and then extended phases with like the liquid crystalline phases and so on. So uh, these are very responsive systems. And for that reason, as I said, they have applications. Okay, soft matter uh, comes in different shapes and colloids are now one of the most popular among uh, physicists and, and other, other scientists because colloids, uh, they can mimic, they can be good models for atomic systems but they can also um, be made, I mean, the colloidal particles can be made tailored. Uh, unlike the micelles that self-assemble and they make these uh, spherical or cylindrical types of structures, in the colloids, you can actually, in the lab, make different shapes um, of colloidal particles, which, of course, if you have different shapes, then you give rise to different assemblies. So colloids are uh, very popular uh, today. Um, and as I said, they come in almost any shape. All of the ones for molecules that exist and some other shapes that molecules that do not exist yet. Um, and then the hope again 
or the aim, the goal is to assemble these molecules and to make the extended system. Making an extended system of colloids, it's a challenge because uh, uh, these systems have many metastable states and they're very slow, so um, they do not assemble that easily into ordered structures. But in any case, the, the amount of work in colloidal systems is, is huge. And in this network, it's also uh, one of the main topics. You can get crystals in nature. These are colloidal crystals, opals, and, and these are minerals. I mean, you can see the shiny colors. These, these represent crystals and or microcrystals. And here you also see this color is called structural color because these colors come from gaps uh, in the band structure of these colloidal crystals, which like uh, the electronic uh, gaps in, in, in atomic solid state systems, um, they will um, they will they will let light uh, because light is of the wavelengths of that gap. So they will um, give rise to these colors that are called for that reason structural colors because they come from the band structure of a colloidal lattice. Here is a colloidal type of crystal, of course, not kill the butterfly. It's not even from the opal to get this type of crystals. You actually need to do it in the lab very carefully. Finally, on colloids, I just want to say that uh, these, these colloids can be seen in real time. So the dynamics can also be studied at the single particle level with uh, the not so new now, but with confocal microscopy. So there's also a lot of research on non-equilibrium states. I focus until now to uh, stable equilibrium states, but of course, many of these systems will exhibit non-equilibrium states and, um, and this can also be studied using confocal microscopy uh, because you can follow these particles at the single particle level. Okay, this is my last topic and I could not, uh, not mention it because I think all of you are um, seeing this video through your screen, either in the computer or in the uh, smartphone. And your screen is most likely uh, an LCD, a liquid crystal display. And liquid crystals are made by molecules, which again are small, like the amphiphiles. And usually, unlike the amphiphiles, their head and tails are not distinguishable, but they sort of uh, elongated. And so they tend to align and they tend to make uh, or to assemble into phases which have a partial order. What does that mean? It means that they, they, they probably like a liquid, they don't have any positional order, but they are aligned in a particular direction. This is the simplest phase, it's called a pneumatic. This is a twisted pneumatic where the axis here of orientation has twists with a certain period. So it's, this is called a cholesteric. This system, for example, will have positional order in 1D, so you can see layers, but also orientational order. And here, the two directions are the same, while here, you have the orientation in different direction and the positional order makes an angle. So all these phases uh, are sometimes occurring the same system. Others, um, the sequence is not universal, but the difference in energy or free energy of these different phases is very, very small. And also you have the isotropic phase and then the crystalline phase. And because these differences are small, because you don't go exactly from the isotropic liquid to the solid. You have all these intermediate phases. So you can think of the energy uh, or the temperature differences is, is, is rather small um, among the different uh, phases. So you change the temperature by a little bit and uh, you can make the other phase stable. By the same token, if you apply an external field, you can actually change um, the order of the system which is already partially ordered. And this is what makes this um, so useful for displays. You don't want to use too much energy to switch on and off your display. You, use, you want to use as little energy as possible. Okay, so this is just a final 
uh, slide, you, you can see here domains of aligned liquid crystalline molecules. I think this is the pneumatic. And um, where, where you see the black, you see the disordered phase. There are some defects. I'm not going to go into defects. You'll have some lectures on defects later on. But besides the displays, uh, believe it or not, you also have crystal, liquid crystals in your own body. And so some proteins and cell membranes are liquid crystalline or they order in that way. This is my last slide. I'm not going to say anything about it. So of course now uh, you can add activity to these particles. And we've been talking about this scale, but you can, if you have active particles, you can have all sorts of other problems at, uh, with similar order, with different order at larger or even smaller length scales. And thank you very much.